How are you guys doing this morning? No, I'm going to ask that again. I'm going to ask that again. How are you guys doing this morning? Yes. How many of you are grateful for another day of life? We are alive and breathing. And that is reason enough to be here and worship the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you to rise with me. We're going to surrender this service to the Lord. I invite you today, there where you are, just surrender your heart, your mind. Surrender it all before the Lord this morning. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence this morning with a grateful heart, with a heart of thanksgiving, with a heart of praise, ready to come and surrender all before your feet, Lord Jesus. Lord, we surrender it all before, before you this morning. Any situation, Heavenly Father, any thoughts, Heavenly Father, that are not for you that are not lining up with you Lord Jesus I pray that you cast it out in Jesus name right now Lord Lord I pray that you take control of the atmosphere I pray that you take control of the service I pray that you take it take control from beginning to end we ask that you have your way this morning we open our hearts and our minds to you Lord Jesus we know that there is nothing impossible for you anything is possible Father, and I pray that you move in favor of those that are needing the impossible to be possible this morning, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. No shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. Yes, Jesus. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. And there is no army with the power to conquer true. You've always been with us. Yes, Lord. Every battle you've already won. We've already won. Hallelujah. Show Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough when anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hot. Show me waters he can pop. He's the God of the breakthrough when anything is possible. It's possible. Yes, Lord, we declare. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh, God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to revive. Oh, he will revive. In the name of Jesus, yes. Show some things at the feet of Jesus. Amen. All anxiety, all depression, in the name of Jesus, all worry, all sickness, I lay it all before the feet of Jesus. And I shake it off in the name of Jesus. I shake it off in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now all of my fear I will 
will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory Come on, let's see your victory dance. Hallelujah. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Break a chain. Break every chain. Yes, break every chain. In the name of Jesus.
right where you are, would you lift your hands with me? The song says that he is our champion. And how many understand in our culture, we celebrate champions. We celebrate champions in the sports realm. We celebrate champions in political realms. We celebrate champions in our own loved ones, right? We celebrate them how? We celebrate them with utterances of our mouth. Right? So if you believe like I believe that he is a champion and he is undefeated, 
I challenge you that right where you are with your hands lifted high, would you give him a praise of a thunder of victory from your mouth? Would you do that right now? That's it. Uh -huh. Because, hold on, hold on. The last time, the last time I looked, he won more than one battle for me. <laughs> he won more than five battles for me. He won more than a lifetime of battles for me. Hello, somebody. So I challenge you this morning, would you just give him this thunder of praise for the next 30 seconds? Would you do that? speaking to everyone that's over 15 years old we got babies in the house out praising some of us we got babies running around because they understand the presence of God more differently than we do so I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds that if you got to run scream shout praise the Lord Lord thank you if all you have to say is thank you say something I have the authority, Jesus has given me. We're going to take this authority this morning and we've received a couple of reports this week of people in the house being ill people in the house being mentally ill physically ill their bodies not catching up with uh, healing so I would like to take this opportunity and just pray over healing is that all right can we do that can we do that Jerry would you come up here for a minute brother come here man I'm not trying to put you on the spot but it has to deal with you Pastor Tim, Pastor TJ, would you please? How many know who Dixie is? His wife, right? The lo loving, endearing Dixie comes in and says hello to everybody, smiles from ear to ear. She's sick. Her body is very ill. She's in a weak state. She's in a position that we need God to show up. All right? So would you do me a favor where you are? While Pastor Tim ministers to Jerry, not just to Jerry, but of point of contact in faith, that Dixie will be healed today. Not tomorrow, not Tuesday. We serve a right now kind of God, amen? Has he shown up for you right now? I need you to have that faith right now. Would you do that? So I need everyone to extend your hand over here towards Jerry. And this is what we're gonna pray for, that Dixie's body would wake up right now in the name of Jesus. That her blood would start 
duplicating, multiplying as it should. That the white blood cells would get back in order, the red blood cells would get back in order. That her nerves, that her arteries, her ventricles, everything would go back in order right now. Would you help me pray for that? Pastor Tim, would you please? Come on, pray with me, guys. Pray in the Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, we send the word of healing right now to Dixie's body. I command the hemorrhaging to stop. I speak to the source. In the name of Jesus, be healed, be restored, and be made whole. I speak to her body to respond to the word of the Lord and the prayer of faith. Every effect, every lasting impact of the stroke, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I speak restoration and healing from the tips of her fingers into the bottom of her toes. I speak peace over her mind now. And I declare she will live, that she will fulfill her days, that she will experience health and recovery. In the name of Jesus, we declare it and call it done. Lord, you said in your word that you sent the word and it healed them. We send the word of healing to her right now. Be made whole in Jesus' name. And Father, strengthen Jerry's body. Lord, from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes, let strength, supernatural strength and healing flow through his body. And I speak health over their household. I speak health over their family. And I declare their latter days are blessed. And will not be inundated with sickness and infirmity and disease and health crises. I call it done and I thank you for it. Now come on, lift your hands for about 30 seconds. And let's just thank God that it's done. Come on, if you believe that he's a miracle worker. Come on, praise him that it's done. Father, I thank you right now an angel is walking into that hospital room. Touching her body. And she is being restored and made whole. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I want to tell you a story. Many years ago, my brother John and I were preaching a revival in a place called Belmont, North Carolina. And there was a young man that came forward for prayer and he said, He said, My father is at home. He's been diagnosed with stage four throat cancer. They've given him weeks to live. Said he's a real hard shell, hardcore Southern Baptist. He doesn't believe in speaking in tongues. He doesn't believe in healing and miracles. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff that we're doing. He is saved, but he thinks we're all a bunch of rabid, radical fanatics. And he said, I tried to get him to come to the revival for prayer but he laughed at me and said it was not real it was fake he said but I'm believing God for my dad's healing we anointed that young man and prayed over him and I'll never forget this as long as I live 9.05 p.m. the next night he shows up with his dad and his dad told this story he said I was laying in the recliner with my oxygen on watching whatever was on television and he said at 905 it was like somebody poured hot oil down my throat into my stomach he said I started shaking I thought he said I thought I was dying and I thought this is how it feels to die he said I closed my eyes and I laid back and my whole body began to tremble and shake and conv convulse. And he said, when I woke up, all the pain, all the discomfort, all the difficulty breathing was gone. He said, I felt strength I haven't felt in a long time. He said that night, he said, I don't know if I'm healed or not, but I know something happened at 9.05 last night. About a month later, we were back in another city about 15 or 20 minutes away. And that young man and his dad came to the revival and testified God had completely healed him of all the cancer. And listen, that man, that man lived for 20 some odd years longer. 
and became one of those rabid, radical, crazy tongue talkers that believed in the miraculous, the supernatural power of God. Listen, God is a healer. I'm going to say it again. I said God is a healer. God is a deliverer. How many know he does today what he did yesterday? The same things that Jesus did when he walked the shores of Galilee, he's still doing in Cleveland, Ohio right now. And I want you to stand in agreement with me that while we're in this place worshiping today, that an angel is walking into Fairview Hospital and touching Dixie's body and that she's going to get up and go home in the next couple of days healed and restored by the power of God. And Jerry, this, this is what I felt the Lord put on my heart this morning as I was praying over her, not just to be healed, but not to have to deal with this issue ever again. Once and for all. All the damage. All the damage. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him this. Say, it's on the way. Come on, tell somebody else. Say, it is on the way. Now, would you put your hands together and give Jesus some praise this morning? In that same, in that same spirit, we uh, unfortunately have a brother named uh, Charles Poindexter. He's been coming here for some time. He's a gentleman that sits back there in the corner, at like the third or the fourth row to the back. His father passed away this week. And we reached out to him, uh, doing the best that we could to comfort him and love on him. But let me tell you something about the Poindexter family. Uh, he was the patriarch of that family and generation. Uh, Charles comes from a lineage of earth movers, earth shakers, life transformers, right? So this week, uh, they're going to view him tomorrow. This week, pray over him and his family. Would you do that? That the Holy Spirit, and if you're watching us, Charles, through interweb, we pray that the counselor comes to you. We mourn and we grieve with you. We pray that the Holy Spirit comes to you, your loved ones, your mother, your family, and bring peace and comfort. You know who the Lord is in your life, and so does your family. And we come together with you in this tough time, but in a celebration of life that he gave all. And because he gave all, he's in heaven. So we love you. We encourage you. Reach out to Charles Poindexter if you have his number. If you don't, I'll share it with you. And just uh, uh, send him a text. We love you. We agree with you. We're praying for you. I need you to pray for my daughter, Yasmin, as well. Uh, Elder Yasmin is going to have my grandbaby, not her daughter. She's going to have my grandbaby. <laughs> She's going to have, uh, she's going to uh, give birth this week on Wednesday. So would you please, uh, I solicit, I beg, I ask of you for prayers over my daughter, that everything would go well, and that hopefully in the next uh, month or so we get to meet uh, uh, Pastor Sam's grandbaby. <laughs> no, 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 I promise she's got a name. You know, I, I'm, just, uh, I'm just sharing the joy that I hear Pastor Tim talk about all the time. So in that time, would you pray for elders Yasmin and Wilson that everything would go well, right? We trust in the Lord that everything will go well. Amen. Would you do me a favor right where you stand? Second Saturday of Tim, I need you to come up here.
Stay with us, all right? Stay with us. These are family issues, right? We're all a family here, right? Elders and pastors, would you come up here? Elders, any more elders in the house? Yes, Elder Sheila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elder Jim, would you come up here? Can I, can I say? Sasha's mom had a really bad accident yesterday. And Willie just told me that there's no reason for her to be alive. Like, the car's mangled. She's, her physical body is beat up, broken bones, uh, issues with her lungs, right? We're, we're going to... I don't know how the service shifted into healing, but that's what we're going to do today. Just pray over healing. So again, would you extend your hands over here? Extend your arms. We need your faith activated today. All right? Father, first of all, thank you for your mercy and grace that protected her and kept her alive. Lord, you didn't keep her alive for her to suffer. But Lord, you kept her alive because you have purpose on her life. And so we send the word of healing right now to that hospital in New York. Speak to her body to recover, to respond to the word of the Lord and the prayer of faith, the muscles, the bones, the fibers, the tendons every part of her body to respond now in the name of Jesus. Stretch forth your hand and touch her now. Let an angel of the Lord walk into that hospital room as well, right now as we pray. I thank you that healing power is flowing into her body, that her vital signs are going to immediately respond, that she is going to have a full and a total recovery, that she's going to live out the fullness of her days without any lasting complications from this accident. I just speak peace right now over the family. I rebuke every spirit of fear, every spirit of doubt in the name of Jesus. Let faith fill that room. Let faith fill the family. And I thank you that there is total and complete recovery. In Jesus' name. Sasha, listen to me. Right now in the name of Jesus, I speak life to her body in the name of Jesus. Her lungs to begin to work properly. Her heart to work properly. Every part of her body responding to the word of the Lord right now. Recovery has begun now. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that it's done. Come on, put your hands together one more time and let's just praise him. Thank you, Jesus. It's just a different atmosphere today. I'm really trying to move, but. Lord, 
We bless you today, Jesus. We bless you today, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sweet presence here. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your peace over our minds, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just worship him where you are just for a minute? Would you do that? Come on, just fill this atmosphere. Fill it with worship. Come on, church, pray in the Holy Ghost. Just, just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Holy Spirit, fill this atmosphere right now. Permeate this atmosphere with your tangible presence. Let your angels walk up and down these aisles and move in and out of these seats right now, touching, healing, restoring. Lord, for those that are watching online, stretch forth your hand and touch them right now. Lord, those that are in nursing homes, hospitals, homebound, I thank you that you're touching them, coming into their room right now, letting them feel your tangible presence. Wrap your arms around them and let them know how much you love them and how deep your care is for them. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. There's a member of our congregation that had a major, major crisis this week. Ended up disappearing and there was a national missing persons search going on for him. Thankfully, he has been found, and he's safe. But he's in the middle of a, of a really big crisis. And so would I, without saying his name, would you just stand in agreement with me for that family? Because listen, how many know all of us go through stuff? Everybody in this building, some of you may be in the middle of a crisis right now. And you see, we learn how to cover stuff up in the church. We learn how to pretend like everything is fine. We know how to smile. We know the lingo to use. We know the body expressions, the mannerisms we're supposed to have to make it look like we're okay. But I promise you there are times that members of this worship team stand up here and lead us in worship. And they're hurting and breaking and crying out inside. There are times I know that you walk into this building. Sometimes it's all you can do to get here. Because some of you text me and call me and Facebook message me and let me know. But this is a, this is a refuge. This is a place of healing. This is a safe place where you can come and encounter the presence of God and nobody's going to judge you and look down on you and, and ask what's wrong with you because we're all struggling. We're all battling. Nobody's got it all together. We're on a journey of faith. Is anybody with me? We are victorious. We are more than conquerors, but that doesn't mean we're not fighting battles. That doesn't mean we're not healing wounds. Come on, is anybody listening to me? That doesn't mean we're not going through stuff. It just means we're victorious. And even when we go into the battle, we know if we fall, we're going to get up because the end has already been decided. Come on, look at your neighbor say, you are a winner. Tell him, say, the outcome has already been determined. 
you're a child of the king. Tell him, say, Jesus is Lord, and he's greater than your trouble. He's greater than your struggle. He's greater than your pain. He's greater than your disappointment. Whatever you're going through, Jesus is still king, and his power is infinitely greater than anything we will ever face or encounter in life. But that doesn't mean we don't feel the weight. We don't experience the sting of the battle when it's taking place. So grab somebody's hand right now. We're going to pray for this family. We're going to pray for every need that is in this house today. As you join that hand, let's pray. Father, I thank you. Lord, that this is a day of healing, that this is a day of restoration. Lord, that this is a day of recovery, that this is a day when you are resurrecting things the devil thought he killed. You're reinvigorating hope in the hearts and the lives of people. And Father, I thank you that you are stopping the onslaught of the enemy. That no weapon formed against your people will prosper. I declare now in the name of Jesus that the tide is shifting. That there is a swing. That the battle is turning. That victory is already established. We're going to begin to see the results of that victory. I praise you for healing broken relationships. I praise you, Lord, for fulfilling things that you have promised over people's lives. I thank you, Lord, for resurrecting hope today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. And amen. Can you be seated for just a moment? Hallelujah, hallelujah. While we get ready to honor the Lord with our tithe and our offering today, uh, I have a couple announcements for us. Uh, one is, uh, my apologies for the Armor Bearers class that should have started last week uh, for scheduling uh, issues and because I'm going to receive my grandbaby, I'm not going to be available. So we will get back on schedule July the 3rd, Wednesday. July the 3rd. Uh, again, my apologies for any inconvenience, but the Armor Bearers class opened up for from 18 to 80. All men are welcome to attend that class. All right, July the 3rd. And the Lord's going to speak to us through it, so I invite you to get there. Amen? Amen. Uh, Pastor Sandra and the women's ministry are uh, going to celebrate their annual uh, women's gathering where you get to bring your husband and your children and your family members and it's going to be held and your dogs and, and Satan I mean cats <laughs> those felines yes. and dogs too bring your pets Tinker's Creek if you don't know where Tinker's Creek is it's in one of the metro parks down in Valley City, Valley View City. Uh, look it up. We'll have the pavilion reserved. Uh, it is potluck. So bring a chili. Bring something to snack on with someone else. Um, it was posted. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I need help. How many of the ladies gathering are here today? Can you raise your hands? There we go. There we go. Okay, ladies. So. This is our annual picnic. So on Facebook, we ask you to put down what you're going to bring. On behalf of the ladies, uh, for the ladies gathering, I will be bringing the hot dogs and the hamburgers. So I will bring that. But we need rice, chicken, macaroni, potato. I mean, you name it, we need it. So if you're bringing a bunch of people with you, make sure you bring enough for all of them. So with that said, please go on. Facebook on the ladies gathering and write down in the common area what you're bringing because I had 20 views and six people answered I was like wait a minute they saw this listen we're gonna have a great time 
We're going to send one of the guys to be there by 2 in the morning to hold that pavilion because you cannot um, book it. You have to be there first come, first serve. But it's behind the house, so I'm hoping that this man behind me right here in the blue shirt, him, will get up early and hold it for us. Again, bring your family, your dogs, your cats, bring everybody. Just come and have a good time. Let's, let's break bread together. Let's, let's laugh. Um, Eric's going to bring his guitar. We're going to sing. I might just sing that day. I just don't know. You know how I feel. So anyway, hope to see you all there. Love you, and I can't wait to celebrate with you on the 13th of July at 10 a.m. in the morning, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Sandra. Pray for traveling mercies for Pastor Nate and Maggie as they're with their family. Uh, that they would arrive in great health and in great wealth. Amen? Amen? Everyone good? Everyone all right? More than. All right. Would you stand up with me? Would you stand up with me? Children, you're dismissed. Children, you are dismissed. Children, you're dismissed. Let's go. <laughs> You guys are starting to act like the adults that don't want to leave the, the main room. <clears throat> children, you are dismissed. Can we thank God for our children, right? Can we thank God for our teachers that teach them in the back? Amen. <laughs> July 10th to uh, up until August, we'll have VBS every Wednesday. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Bring your children, bring your neighbor's children. July 10th to August the 7th every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Amen? Up to fourth grade. Thank you. Up to fourth grade. Don't bring fifth and sixth graders to drop them off. We ain't no babysitter. Never mind. I, did my thoughts say that out loud? I am so, I'm so sorry. Are you ready to honor the Lord today? Let's go unto the Father. Every eye closed and every heart bowed. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for provision. We thank you for obedience. We thank you for faith that we give unto you today, Lord, out of obedience because we have a commitment with you. Lord, to bless the house, Lord, to, uh, because we believe who you are. We believe what you've done. We believe what you're doing in us, through us, in our households. Lord, this is not about the amount. This is about our commitment with you. So I thank you that everyone here has an obedient attitude, a cheerful attitude to give unto you today. Lord, we bless your name today and we thank you for all that people, your loved ones, Lord, your children give unto the house. And we will see fit that we do the best honorable, accountable thing, Lord, to manage your finances. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you. And we all say, Amen, amen. Would you take a second, jump out of your seats, come up and deposit your tithe and your offering? Would you do that quickly? <clears throat> now, I'm going to ask you to stay standing because I'm going to give, I'm going to present Pastor Tim thereafter. So I don't want you to stand up and down, up, down and up, up and down. Come on. And if you're able to stand, would you stand with me this morning? If you have a medical condition, you're excused. But if you can stand, stand with me this morning. And with a great big, Lord, we thank you for the grace gift in the house. Let's receive our senior pastor, Tim Walker. Come on, clap your hands and let's bless the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Just remain standing with me for just a moment. I love this. Fred told me, he said, Pastor, I'm so sorry I dropped your phone. And I think I chipped the end of it and broke the screen a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing you under the bus, Fred. But I said, that's all right, because I dropped it earlier this week and broke the other side of it. And have a replacement on the way. So that was a sign from the Lord that uh, it was time to get a new phone. 
So listen, learn from me. Take some wisdom from my mistakes. Buy a real good case for $30 or $40 that will protect your $1,200 phone. It is a very good investment. Take it from my experience. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. You know, before I got to do this, and I'm just, I'm kind of going back and forth because it's not the routine, but I, I know the worship team just went out and they're getting their drinks, using the restroom and coming in. But can somebody get Joey and Janice for me real quickly? I have something from the Lord that I want to share with them. Listen, today is a different day. I've learned after 23 years of doing this that God can do more in a matter of just a couple of moments than we can do in years and years or even a lifetime. And when God speaks, listen to me, when God speaks, we need to respond. How many have ever talked yourself out of something God is saying? I've been guilty of it myself. And then look back and, why didn't, why didn't I act on that? I'll never forget, I drove by a building. We, most of you know we've been looking for couple of years I drove by a building and I heard the Lord say reach out to them but I didn't know anybody I asked around couldn't find anybody there was a sign in the front that was the church set on a corner had a sign in the front with a Bible on it about two weeks later I had a dream and I woke up I didn't even know this was a song until I googled it and I found myself singing a sign shaped like a Bible saying summer revival. There's a million dead churches just filling up an acre of land. And I knew the Lord was telling me to do something and to reach out, but I didn't know anybody. I even went over there and looked around. There was nobody there. And so I let it slip away and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm just seeing stuff, making stuff up. The, the yard was manicured. The building looked meticulous. A few months later, I drive by and find out that building had been donated. A million and a half dollars donated to a hospital. Because even though the yard was manicured, manicured and the building was in beautiful condition, they only had five or six people coming on Sunday morning. They couldn't carry the weight of it, and so they donated it. And that could have been ours for free. I know you hate me now. I, I know. <laughs> Listen, nobody has beat themselves up more than I have over that moment. But I made a decision then. I said, Lord, if I err, I'm going to err on the side of trying to be obedient to what you tell me to do. And so now I check on everything. I try out everything. I, you know, the worst thing that can happen is them say, no, I'm not interested. Nothing wrong with being turned down. How many have ever been turned down? How many wanted to ask her out on a date, but because you didn't, somebody else came along and... This happened in the job market. It's happened in the church market. And guys, when the worship was going on today, I kept hearing in my spirit... The battle that you have waged and the war that you have fought is turning. There is a generational anointing upon your lives that's been passed down to you. Joey, I'm sorry, brother, but there is an anointing on your life to preach the gospel. And you can, you can embrace it and let God develop that in your life and if you'll do that you will see God use you you'll travel all over the world and declare the things of God in areas and cultures where most of us will never go and Janice God chose you and ordained brought the two of you together for this season in your life and the enemy's aware of that and so he has targeted your mind and he has beat you up for months. And I'm not trying to embarrass you, darling. I'm telling you, 
from the Holy Ghost. The devil has tried to break you down. He's tried to get you to quit the worship team. He's tried to get you to drop out of church. He's tried to get you to pull away from relationships with people that you've been connected to for many, many years because he is terrified of what happens when the two of you stand together because you're mighty warriors in the kingdom of God. And I heard the Lord say today, and Janice, listen to me, sweetie. I heard the Lord say today, as you were standing right over here during the, during the worship, I heard the Lord say, say to her, the tide has turned. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you you're going to see the change tomorrow, but I'm telling you the tide has turned and you watch, you're going to start seeing it happen. Stuff you've been praying over, God's going to start bringing it to pass. Battles that you've been fighting, you're going to scoff at now. Because there's a warrior on the inside. The two of you need to, every day, you need to join your hands together. You need to pray powerfully in the spirit. Pray together. Because together, you guys are a formidable force against the power of darkness. And the reason you've been targeted is because of the calling that is on your life. And we're not going to give the devil the luxury of beating you guys up anymore. Today. Today it is over. Stretch your hands to them right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless Joey and Janice. In the name of Jesus, I come against every attack of the enemy upon their lives. I declare that the tide has turned, that even as you have spoken, the tide has turned today. And that victory is coming. That victory is going to manifest shortly. Lord, that the destiny and the purpose that you have planned for them, they are going to live it out to the fullness. And that not one single promise is going to fall to the ground. That everything that you have spoken, you're going to bring it to pass. I impart to them a new anointing, a fresh anointing as they've never experienced before. Begin to create platforms for them to stand on opportunities for them to step into don't shy away from opportunities don't disqualify or talk yourself out of things God is trying to create for you step boldly and courageously and confidently into the things that God is opening for you and as you do you will see the Lord begin to enlarge it and increase it and you will become more and more comfortable you will become more and more confident you will become more and more complete in the anointing that is on your life as you learn as you use it you will learn to understand the depth of that anointing and the full magnitude of that calling as you're faithful in the small things god says i will open the great things that i have laid up in store for you says the lord Come on, lift your hands one more time and just praise God. Father, I thank you for an impartation, an impartation of special anointing upon their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. While you're standing, grab your Bibles, open them up with me to the book of Genesis. And I'm going to be all over the place. I'm going to be very brief in my message today. Just hold your Bible up. Say, Lord, thank you for your word. I open my heart to receive it. And I thank you that I am the good ground that's going to bring forth fruit a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Sometime back, I was talking to a businessman who's part of our congregation, and he was going through a very difficult time of transition. He was trying to make some really, really tough decisions. And as I was trying to help him find wisdom and seek out the mind of God as to what the best decisions to make where I asked him just a simple question. I said, what are your dreams? Where do you hope to be in five years from now? What are your 
expectations, spiritually, financially, in your career, in your family? What's your projections for the next five years? And, and he said something to me that really captivated my mind, and I, I wrote it down. He said, Pastor, I've been so busy working this business and raising my family that I don't have time to dream. He said, to be honest, so many of my dreams didn't come to pass that I gave up dreaming a long time ago. I've become a realist, and I just kind of deal with life as it happens. And I thought about that over the next couple of days, and I couldn't help but wonder how many people sit in church pews, not just at Church Alive, but all over the country that have allowed busyness, setbacks, the opinions of others, circumstances or situations to define the parameter of their life. Instead of dreaming, instead of believing for something bigger and greater, except, except, uh, instead of having a, a higher expectation, we have just learned to accept whatever is as our reality. We've given up hope that anything greater is coming or that any improvement is on the way. We call ourselves realist. In reality, we've just quit dreaming. And you see, it can be in marriage, it can be in business, it can be in career. It can be in our calling. It can even be in our walk with God. And so I want to take a few minutes today to remind you that no matter where you are, God has something greater. Be content and be grateful with what you have, but never stop believing for God to do greater things. What we have is not everything that God is capable of doing in our lives. The, the Apostle Paul says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Another translation says immeasurably beyond anything that you can ask or even think about. In other words, what he's saying is the moment that your mind frames it in a thought, God says, I want you to know I can exceed that. I can go beyond that. He wrote to the church at Corinth and he said it like this. I has not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has, everybody say prepared. prepared. Come on, look at your neighbor and say it's already prepared. Do you realize God has prepared things for you that are beyond your ability to fathom or even imagine in your wildest expectations? It's already set in place. It is already prepared. And that's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 said, I'm praying for you that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that you could begin to comprehend what your inheritance is in Christ Jesus. And he's not just talking about spiritual things. He's talking about everything that is needed in life because Peter said he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so my, my challenge is to get you to start believing God for something greater. That no matter where you are, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what's happening in your life or what has happened in your past, look at your neighbor and tell him this, say, your best is still ahead. Come on, somebody say it out loud, say, my best is still ahead. Come on, say it again, say, my best days are not behind me. They are ahead of me. I've come to wake somebody up today because somebody needs to dust off their Bible. Somebody needs to pick up a promise book. Somebody needs to pull out a diary that has been up in the closet for a long time. Somebody needs to resurrect a dream. You need to remind yourself of things that God has spoken over your life that the devil has come and told you will never happen. I've come to set a fire under you and to remind you that if God said it, he's going to do it. If he's spoke it, he's going to bring it to pass. Can somebody lift your hands up and bless the Lord this morning? You see, way too often we allow 
the setbacks, the disappointments, the brokenness of life, the clutter, the distractions, the commitments, the obligations, the responsibilities to cause us to just live life by default. Kind of whatever will be, will be. But one more time, say this out loud. Say, God has great things in store for me. Come on, say it again. Say, God has great things in store for me. How many really believe that? Do you really believe that God has great things in store? So then if you really do, I want to ask you something. What would you do for God if you knew you could not fail? What adventure would you go on in business, with your family, with your health, if you knew the outcome was already determined and that you were going to succeed? You see, oftentimes it's the fear of failing. It's the fear of the embarrassment. It's the fear, now I'm going to get, it's going to get, tight here for a moment. It's the fear of losing what we already have that causes us not to risk pursuing something greater. But everybody say this out loud. Say, no matter where I am, God has something greater. Come on, say it again. Say, no matter where I am, God has something greater. We call this a destiny. That God has a destiny. That God has a future, that God has something significantly beyond where we are right now. Now write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. While we all have the capacity for greatness, everybody in this room has the capacity to do something significant with your life. You're not here by accident or coincidence, no matter what your mother told you. You're not an accident. You were chosen You were ordained. Is anybody with me in the house today? God determined the first breath that you would take and he will determine the last. You have a destiny on your life. But while we have the capacity for greatness, we also can very easily develop an inclination toward mediocrity. We can allow the setbacks to cause us to step back from pursuing our dreams. And instead of developing our skills, finishing college, launching that business, buying that house, writing that book, getting involved in ministry, taking that risk. Instead of doing that, we back up, fortify what we have. And learn how to live below the privileges and the promises that God has for us. And so in order to draw out destiny, everybody say destiny. Destiny. Come on, before I go any further, i got to say it again. Look at your neighbor and say, there's destiny on your life. Come on, tell somebody else, say, there's destiny on your life. Now we're going to get real personal. Put your hand right on your chest. Say, there's destiny on your life. There's something significant for you. You are not called just to live and die. You are here for a purpose. You have a divine assignment. Everybody say, there's destiny on my life. And in order to draw out destiny, God gives us a dream. A dream is the ability to see in the spirit what you can't see in the natural. A dream is the the capacity, and this is how I wrote it down in my notes. A dream is the ability to see in your heart what you cannot see with your eyes. A dream gives you the ability to see what others cannot see. It's seeing something when your eyes are closed that is completely different than what you're seeing when they're open. A dream sees what can be, not what is. It's the ability to look through the problems and see the promise. It it awakens your passion and energizes your mind and empowers your spirit. 
A dream awakens things on the inside of you. Now, I got I to gotta be real honest with you because there, there are essentially three types of dreams. They're daydreams. And it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with daydreaming, but sooner or later you got to get up. And you got to do something. I mean, you can, you can want to be effective and successful in life and business and ministry and, and calling and marriage and all of those things. But as long as you're sitting on your seat of do nothing, singing, I shall not be moved, it's just a daydream. Come on, is anybody with me? They're, they're daydream. How many know we got a lot of folks that are daydreamers? They spend endless hours scrolling on social media. And they think that's activity. They think that that's being active. They think, I'll leave that alone. That's a daydream. And then there are externally inspired dreams. Have you ever driven through... Um, a, 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 a real exclusive neighborhood. Maybe you've gone down, um, what, what is that, lake, lakeside, um, lake road, is that what that is? And seen those beautiful mansions on the, on the water, and you thought, man, I'd love to have one of those one day. And your mind starts dreaming, and you start thinking, I wonder what these people do for a living that gives them the ability to afford these kinds of houses. And, and typically one of two things will happen. Either you'll get resentful against them or you'll start stretching yourself. I wonder what I could do. Maybe I, maybe I could do some eBay and maybe I could do some Uber and maybe I could do some door dashing and, and I could sell some stuff I don't need and I could, I could do this and I could rearrange that. And you never do it, but it causes something to happen on the inside of you. You start dreaming about it. And then a couple of days later, you see something else that catches your attention. You forgot all about the mansions on the lake. And now you're thinking about that, that classic automobile that's in the, you know, in the parking lot at the, at the car show. I mean, how many know what I'm talking about? Those, those are externally inspired dreams, and some of them are actually good. Some of them will awaken things on the inside of you. Some of them will motivate you to make changes in your life. Like when you look in the mirror, and you realize your clothes don't look that good, and you got to keep getting bigger sizes, and you realize, I need to change the way I eat, I need to go to the gym. I need to get in shape. Come on, let me listen to what I'm talking about. Those are externally inspired dreams, and some of them are good, and some of them are just passing fancies. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God-inspired dreams. I'm talking about things that the Spirit bursts in your spirit. Something that God brings to you. Someone said, a dream from the Lord is called hope with a blueprint. I, I, I love that. A dream will cause you to be, become so discontent with where you are because it's not where you know you're supposed to be. A dream will cause you to become discontent with what you see around you because it's not what you see within you and it will force you to make changes in your life. I'm talking about God dropping a calling in your heart or a business idea in your heart or giving you something that you know is inspired by the Lord or maybe it's finding a promise in the word. And you read the scripture and a promise just jumps out of that word. Have you ever just been reading the scripture and a promise jumps out of the word and just climbs all up in your spirit? And no matter what you do, you can't shake it. And that, that word is marinating on the inside and growing on the inside and birthing something on the inside. God is trying to birth something in your life. It's called a dream. Everybody say a dream. A dream is designed to awaken your destiny. 
to get you to understand that where you are is not where you're supposed to stay. But this, listen, there's one more aspect of this, and that's called a discipline. Everybody say destiny, destiny. dreams, dreams. And discipline. God has a destiny for your life. But in order to awaken that destiny, he's got to birth a dream. But if a dream is never connected to discipline, you will spend your whole life wanting, pursuing, and dreaming about things that never happen. Discipline is training that develops self-control, character, order, and efficiency. Listen, it's creating the habits that produce the results that you're dreaming of. Now, now look at me. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Most of us, don't look at your neighbor right now. Look at yourself. Most of us have upward dreams and downward habits. I'm going to say that one more time. We have upward dreams. We see something bigger, something greater. We see the promises of God. We see the things that maybe we can pursue and fulfill with our family, our career, our business, our ministry. The, 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 the opportunities are there. We see the, the dream. We have upward dreams. We have downward habits. In other words, the things that we are doing, our daily routine, our regular lifestyle is sabotaging the dream that we're trying to pursue. And it doesn't matter whether you're a hairdresser or a doctor or a teacher or a pastor. Whatever your occupation is, if your habits don't line up with your dreams, you never see the fulfillment of what you're pursuing. You never live out destiny. If there's not the discipline to that are the, the disciplines that are necessary to fulfill the dreams, destiny is never experienced. I'll, I'll put it in a really practical way. How many would love to get out of debt? Come on, don't lie to me. How many would love to be debt free? Hold your way, way high, high. Some of you need two hands and a foot up. Okay. How many would love to be out of debt? But if you keep spending on credit cards. If you keep buying stuff you don't need to impress people you don't like or buying things that you can't afford, you're never going to experience the dream of getting out of debt. How many want a greater walk with the Lord? Wave at me. How many want to be closer to Jesus? How many want to know him more? I had somebody, in fact, I posted this on social media without out, outing the person, but someone said to me, Pastor, I've been, I, I've been waiting, and I've been waiting on this word, and God's just not speaking to me, and, 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 and he's just not talking to me. I don't understand. Heaven is like brass, and God's just not talking to me. And I said to them, I said, have you been in your Bible? They're saying, they, they, they said to me, they said, no, I need a word from the Lord. Complaining that God is not speaking when you're not opening up his word or tuning in with your spirit to get in his presence is an upward dream with a downward habit. It's like wanting health in your body but being determined to eat at Burger King three times a week. I should have said Taco Bell. That would have been more... So the point I'm trying to get across is we have to develop certain disciplines. We have to understand that life is a process. That victory is the outcome. It is a harvest. But it is a result of seeds that have been sown along the way. And if we can learn to see the harvest in the seed before we sow it, we can sow intentionally for what we desire as an outcome. And so everybody say this with me. Everybody say destiny. Dreams and discipline. All through the scriptures you will see God coming to people. Amazingly, it seems like it's always in the least opportune moment. When you're most unsuspecting and God speaks a word. 
or so is a dream. In Joseph's case, he's a young 17-year-old boy, and he begins to have a natural dream, a dream in his sleep. That's outrageous. It's unfathomable. Uh, unfathomable. It's ridiculous. In that culture, it's absolutely impossible for the dream that God gave him to come to pass. The dream is, without going into a lot of detail, the dream is, is that every member of his family is going to bow down to him, that he is going to be the most prominent, that he is going to be the highest elevated and that he is going to, in a sense, rule over all of his family. He is the second from the youngest of 12 boys. And in that culture, it did not happen that way. It was absolutely impossible for this to happen. But we see, if you know the story of Joseph, down the road, God actually brought that dream to pass. It took time. Everybody say time. It took time. He went through a lot of issues, dealt with a lot of setbacks. But over a period of time, God fulfilled his word. Now listen to me closely because I'm going I'm to take about, about 15 more minutes and I'm going to be done. But you got to catch this. Most of our teaching when it comes to Joseph is on the struggle that he endured. And the pain. And the obstacles that he had to overcome. We're very well aware he was sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites. He's taken down to Egypt. He's sold into the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife pursues him. He runs away. She catches his garment, falsely accuses him. He ends up in jail, prison, forgotten, until a baker and a butler had a dream, and he interprets the dream, and he ends up in the house of Pharaoh. That's the cliff notes. Of the life of Joseph. And most of our preaching and teaching is focused on the struggle and the pain that he endured during the delay. But I, before I get to the disciplines, I want to just take a moment to remind you that God kept his promise. Look at your neighbor and tell him this say, God kept his promise. Come on, say it again. Say, God kept his promise. Joseph didn't just make it, he flourished. He didn't just survive, he experienced the fullness of God's blessing. He prospered. He experienced the maximum of the dream that God had given him. And not only did God elevate him and raise him up, but he was put in such a position that he was able to bless those around him. He was able to preserve his family and take care of his family. And he was able to preserve the lineage of the Messiah. And I want to encourage somebody today that feels like like you've been forgotten. You feel like God has passed over you. You feel like the promise has not come to pass. You're watching other people get blessed and you're wondering where is my blessing. And you're watching people that are giving less effort do better than what you are and you're saying that's not fair. This is not right. And you've been questioning or you've been questioning yourself and you've maybe even been doubting God. But I've come to challenge you to dream again because God didn't deposit that dream within you just to give you some kind of emotional release. He gave you that dream to resurrect your destiny. There is a destiny and there is a promise. And if God said it, he's going to do it. And his promise is not going to fail. You're going to get through this. You're going to make it. You're going to come out on the other side. And the end is going to be greater than the beginning. Can somebody lift your hands up and bless the Lord in this place today? Hallelujah. Yes. Glory be to God. So what did Joseph need to do to obtain the fulfillment? Uh -huh. uh -uh, my time is gone. i got to give these to you quickly. The first thing, the most important thing, while you're waiting on your dream to come to pass, look at this, nurture. Everybody say nurture. nurture. Come on, talk to me. Everybody say nurture. Nurture your relationship with God. Listen, guys, I don't, have, I don't have three hours to preach this, though I could. If you're going to experience the fullness of God's blessing and purpose on your life, you have to nurture 
your relationship with the Lord. I, f- I found this verse that is so powerful. Look at Genesis 39 and verse number 2. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Look at this. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. I read that and man, something jumped up out of that passage into my spirit. Look at this. Everybody say, in the home of his Egyptian master. This is about as bad as it can get. He is a slave in the house of a master serving someone else, not out of the goodness of his heart, but out of trepidation for his life. Because if he didn't serve, guess what happened? The first thing they'd do is they would strip you down and beat you. And then if that didn't work, they would strip you down and beat you and put you in a prison or a jail. And then they'd give you one more chance. And if that didn't work, they'd make you a foot shorter from the top. Some of you figured that out on the way home. But think about this. He is, these are kind of comfortable. He is in the home of an Egyptian master. And yet everything he did prospered. Working for a boss that doesn't like you. Nasty, vengeful, vindictive co-workers. An ex-wife who's out to get you. I should have said ex-husband who's out to get you. Don't read anything into that. An ex-husband who's an ex who's out to get you. Neighbors who don't like you. Family members who don't want you to succeed. You get the point. You understand, you understand what I'm talking about? In the most inconvenient environment. And he's not given the opportunity and he's not given favor and he doesn't have any privilege and yet he succeeds and he flourishes in every single thing he does. Why? Somebody say, say the Lord. Come on, say it again. Say the Lord was with Joseph. Listen, when God is with you, it doesn't matter who's against you. When God is on your side, it doesn't matter who's trying to take you down. If God be for you, who can be against you? Promotion doesn't come from the hierarchy of the company. Promotion comes from the Lord. One moment of favor is worth more than a lifetime of labor and struggle. The Lord was, oh my God, I got to preach this. God will promote you when your your cubicle partner is trying to sabotage you. God will bless you in the midst of a downturning economy. God knows how to take care of his people and preserve his promises. Somebody shout, my trust is in the Lord. The Lord was with Joseph. That's why he named his sons, listen to this. He named his first son Manasseh. Meaning the Lord has made me forget my hardships and the pain of my father's house. Talk about hardship. Talk about pain. Talk about rejection. How did I get through it? Somebody say the Lord. Come on, say it again. Somebody say the Lord. The Lord has made me forget. He named his second son Ephraim, meaning God has made me prosperous in the land of my affliction. Here's a man that dealt with every kind of hurt and setback 
and disappointment and frustration and betrayal that you can think of. He had more problems in a month than most people have in a lifetime. And it took him 12 years, some theologians say 17 years, going through the process. But in the middle of all of this, he nurtured his relationship with God. And that's why he was able to preserve his integrity. That's why when temptation came, he didn't fall into the allurement of it. That's why instead of being bitter and resentful against those that had hurt him and mistreated him, he was able to guard his heart and keep his attitude right because he nurtured his relationship with God. And listen, I'm trying to get something in your heart today. If you want to flourish in life, you got to get in the presence of God. There is no substitute for prayer. There is no substitute for time in the Word. There is no substitute for worship. If you want to experience the power of God, if you want to experience the strength of God, you've got to nurture your relationship with God. You've got to spend enough time in His presence for God to confront you and to correct you and to counsel you and to heal you and to mold you and to shape you so that He can use you. Can somebody clap your hands and bless Him today? I, 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 got, I got to move on, but, but listen, his whole life was guided by this one thing. And the Lord was with Joseph. God, no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to nurture my relationship with Jesus. Because, uh, listen, I got to say this, I got to say this. If you're not intentional about nurturing your relationship with God, The natural tug of the world will pull you out of his presence, pull you out of church, pull you out of the time in the word. It'll pull you out of that place of worship. You'll find yourself a stranger to the Lord your God. The second thing about about Joseph, and i got to start wrapping this up, is he chose a life... Oh, my Lord, this gets difficult now. Can I go till 1230? Is that okay? Okay. He chose a lifestyle of service. Look at, look at Genesis 37 too. Joseph, a young man of 17, was feeding, everybody say tending the flocks. Everybody say that again. Say tending the flocks. One more time. Tending the flocks. With his brothers and brought their father a bad report about them. I literally heard a preacher trying to justify what the brothers did to him. Preached a sermon. I I watched the whole sermon. It's called Snitches Will Get Stitches. I don't think he was snitching. I think he was reporting, if you read the passage, he was reporting their negligence, their bad behavior. I'll tell you what was going on. Joseph was troubled by their dysfunction. This was a messed up family. This was a man that was married to two women. One by default and one out of desire. This was a family where the boys fought among themselves and there was jealousy and there was all kinds of family conflict. This was not the Brady Bunch. Our father knows best. This was constant drama like some of you deal with in blended families. This was constant drama. Let me tell you what had happened. They had committed murder. Reuben, the firstborn, had committed incest with Jacob's wife. They were neglecting the flocks and engaging in behavior that was destructive to the family. And while they were off doing their stuff, what was Joseph doing? Tending the flocks. And something... Just 
was quickened to me by the Holy Spirit because we all get hung up on the fact that Joseph had a dream of his brothers bowing down and serving him. Listen, if you're going to write something down out of my message today, write this down. Before God gave him the dream of others serving him, he was serving others. Maybe I need to say that again. Before he ever had a word that he was going to be a leader, he was first a servant. He first served the people that God put him over to lead. And we see this tendency all through Joseph's life. He served his father. He served Potiphar. He served the jailer. And he served Pharaoh. I hope you write one more thing down and I hope it's this. Serving is training for reigning. A lot of people love to reign, but they don't want to train. We love to be in charge, but we're not willing to be submitted. I remember my dad saying to me when I told him I was called into ministry, he said, great, and he gave me a responsibility. My first job in the church was cleaning the bathrooms. And they were nasty and filthy. And people don't know how to aim. And they don't just... You have to mop the floor and clean the floor every stinking week. The toilet is this big. Anyway, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm still traumatized. But, but I'll never forget him saying to me, Son, if you don't serve before you lead... You've heard me say this, you will not understand the weight of the burden or the sting of the whip. you got to do it first before you ask anybody else to do it. That's what a leader does. A leader doesn't ask of others what he's not willing to do himself. L listen, I hope you write this down too. The anointing does not exclude you from the process. I'm anointed, I'm gifted, I've got this talent, I've got that talent. Great! Get in the process. Someone came to me and said, I want to preach on Sunday morning. I said, great, get in line. Some of you are already offended and upset. What do you mean get in line? You see, we got people that have been serving and have been giving of themselves for years. They've been studying. They've been, they've been teaching in youth ministry. They've been teaching in children's church. They've been teaching in middle school. They've been leading outreaches. They've been going to the nursing home. Come on, is anybody listening to what I'm talking about? I don't care how talented or how gifted you are. The anointing does not exclude you from the process. You've got to go through the pruning. You've got to go through the training before you're ready for reigning. It is dangerous to release people who haven't learned responsibility. You can't be a king until you're first a keeper. You can't be faithful in the palace until you've learned how to endure the pit. Come on, is anybody listening to what I'm talking about? There's something that God has to develop within your character. And our problem is, is we promote people based on their gifting or their talent or their charisma or their personality. And then when they fall, we're shocked. How did this happen? My question is not how did it happen. My question is how did they get there? Joseph chose a lifestyle of service. And at every level of service, God developed something within him that prepared him for the next thing. In the pit, he was prepared for the house of Potiphar. In the house of Potiphar, he was prepared to go into the prison. In the prison, he was prepared for the palace. Isn't it amazing? All of them start with a P. The pit, the Potiphar, the prison, the palace. Because it's the process. Look at your neighbor and say, don't get weary in the process. Come on, tell somebody else, say, don't get weary in the process. 
This is just what you got to go through. This is just part of God refining you. This is just part of God developing you. This is just part of God equipping you. Because when he raises you up, no devil's going to be able to pull you down. Come on, is anybody hearing what I'm talking about? When men promote you, you will fall. But if God promotes you, he will sustain you. Can somebody clap your hands and bless the Lord today? Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing and I'm done. I'm done. He refused to allow the difficulties of life to make him bitter. Look at Genesis 45, verse 5. He says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He's talking to his brothers. Look at this. My Lord, I don't have this grace, guys. I wish I did. I'm a pretty graceful, forgiving person. But I would have wanted to smack them around. Come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. you got family members you won't even speak to because they borrowed money and won't pay it back. They sold him into slavery. Listen, they sold him for the price of a crippled slave. Basically saying he's worthless. Has no value. But he says, don't worry guys. Don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What an incredible perspective on life. You did everything you could. You would have. In fact, a couple of you guys wanted to kill me. And Reuben saved my life. Because you wanted to kill me. But I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. Don't worry about me seeking vengeance now that dad is dead. I realize there's providence involved. I realize God, notice this, God didn't send me there to preserve my life. God sent me there to preserve all of us. All of us. Listen, life is unfair. Stuff happens. Nobody plans to be in the situations that we're in. Nobody gets up one day and says, you know what? I want to be broke, busted, disgusted, depressed. I want, I want, I want to go through a divorce. I want to, I want to lose my house. I want my car to be repossessed. I, I want to have all these sicknesses and diseases. And I just want to have, I just want to have, I just want a life of chaos. Nobody writes books on how to get depressed. It happens because life comes at us fast and furiously, and sometimes stuff happens that we're not prepared for, and we don't know how to deal with it. And when things happen that we don't have the emotional or the spiritual equipping to deal with, sometimes we pick up baggage and we drag it with us. And then it gets worse and it gets worse. And the, far, the, the longer that we don't address it and the more we neglect it, the worse it gets. Until we find ourselves in circumstances and situations that we feel powerless to overcome. But what I love about Joseph is in the middle of a chaotic dysfunctional, abusive life. He says, I'm not going to allow what other people did to me to make me bitter and resentful. I'm going to forgive it. I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to protect my heart. I wrote some things down and I want to give this to you as I close. First of all, everybody say he was slandered. Come on, say it again. Say he was slandered. He was sold for the price of a crippled slave. They were saying to those who purchased him, he is worthless, he is incapable, he has no value. And listen, sometimes your greatest opposition comes from the people who should believe in you the most. But you can't force people to love you. You can't force people to stay true to you. You can't force people to treat you right. You can only control your behavior, not theirs. 
He was slandered. Not only was he slandered, he was shamed. In Genesis 37, 22, or 23, rather, it says, and they stripped him of his robe. The Hebrew indicates that they humiliated him by making him walk around naked. As they mocked him and they ridiculed him and took things from him that were precious and private. Who knows what else he endured. The pain is real. The wounds are real. The brokenness is real. Maybe some of you sitting here today have had your privacy violated. Maybe precious things have been stolen from your life. And the enemy is trying to convince you that you're disqualified. He's trying to shame you with your past. He's trying to shame you with the decisions and the choices that you or someone else made. But you know, I'm going to tell a pretty disgusting story as I conclude today. Because this resonated in my spirit. And really brought my whole sermon into perspective. Without being graphic, I had gone into a Panera restroom. For those of you that don't know, Panera is my second office. And if you haven't tried their new salads, you really should. Free advertisement. Maybe somebody will see that and give me a gift card from Panera. Who knows? Maybe not. It doesn't matter. I'd gone into the restroom at Panera, not without being graphic. I, I was in a hurry because I had to go really bad. And I waited like, you know, people do. I waited and waited and waited and waited until I had to actually run in there and do my business. I ran in the bathroom. I'm, I'm using the bathroom and I looked down into the toilet and there was a $100 bill. I now have to make a choice. (laughs) A difficult choice. And so I thought about it while I finished. And when I got done, and I will be standing back in the door shaking hands afterward. when When I got done, yes, I reached into the toilet. I pulled out the $100 bill, I went to the sink, I washed my hands with antibacterial soap about five times, I washed off the $100 bill to make sure it wasn't fake, I took it home, I dried it with the blow dryer, I took it to the bank and got five twenties for it. And I realized something. I hope we're not streaming right now. But look at me, guys. Even if you feel like you've been cracked. Nobody leave. Nobody move. Look at me for a moment. Too often we shun the $100 bill in the toilet. Because of what it's been subjected to. But it still spends. It's still worth. Five twenties. It will still pay your bills. It still has the same value. That it had before it ended up there. You know what I think happened? I think somebody. Used the toilet, didn't flush, dropped a hundred dollar bill in the toilet and thought, "Ah, I ain't touching it. And they shunned something just because of the environment that it was in. Look at me guys, don't miss this. You still have a destiny on your life. You still have infinite value and purpose. 
you might feel like you're in a toilet right now. You might feel like your life stinks. You're covered up by all kinds of mess, undesirable, unwanted, unfair circumstances, situations. But Joseph is a shining example to us that God is a God of second chances and that what he has started in your life, he's going to fulfill it and he's going to complete it. And listen, listen to me closely. Don't miss this. The most important thing I've said to you. Where you are does not define who you are. This is just where you're at at the moment. He is faithful who has begun a good work in you. And he's going to fulfill it. Bow your hearts and let's pray. Father, I pray for every person that's in this house today. Lord, I realize that the illustration that I gave was riveting, disgusting, and really cringeworthy. But it exemplifies the point that nothing that's happened, nothing we've been through, nothing that anyone has ever done to us, or nothing we've ever done to ourselves can disqualify us from your love and your goodness. That you're a loving, merciful, gracious God who remembers his covenant and keeps his promises. Lord, I know there's destiny on every life that's in this building today. You've given us dreams to draw out that destiny. And so, Lord, as we nurture our relationship with you, as we serve a life, as we choose a lifestyle of service, and as we guard our hearts and say we're not going to allow the bitter things in life to make us bitter, I ask you, Lord, to keep us on track and fulfill every promise that you have spoken. In the priceless name of Jesus, nobody looking around, stick with me for 30 seconds. If you're in this house today and you say, Pastor, you've been talking to me today, that's me. I feel like I'm that $100 bill. Right, I'm ready for God to begin to do something new and fresh in my life. I want you to hold your hand up real quickly. I won't embarrass you. I see hands going up. That's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Would you stand? Would everybody stand with me, please? And here's what I'm going to do because I know... We've had a very long service today. But listen to me, guys. Listen. Most of us are here one time a week. Can you give God two, two and a half hours one time a week? Or are you in such a hurry that you've got to rush in and rush out? Listen, there's a hundred churches in the city of Cleveland that have an hour and a half service. And I'm not telling you to find one of them. I'm telling you to stretch yourself. Because God wants to do something in your life. This isn't just about coming together and going through some kind of a religious ritual. This is about getting real and getting into God's presence so we can get changed. So we can get healed. Is anybody tired of dragging baggage? Is anybody tired of dealing with the same issues over and over and over and over again? Is anybody ready to live destiny? Is anybody ready for a breakthrough, a release, a change? I don't want to spend the rest of my life fighting the same giants. I want to see some new victories. I want to see some new territory. I I want something greater than this. God has so much more. I don't want to get stuck here. If that's you and you say, Pastor, I'm ready. I am ready for God to begin to draw out my dreams and fulfill the things he's spoken over my life. Move quickly. I want you to join me in this altar. Anybody that says, I'm just, I'm.